Good morning, Sandy. For it's a great privilege and pleasure to join you this morning in your second of your studies on Mark's Gospel. I and Liz greet you. Uh, we pray regularly for you. We look forward to the day when God shows it clearly just who is to be the next uh, minister, pastor of Sandiford, and we rejoice that um, even though there is at the moment uh, no minister, God is greatly blessing your life and your ministry, um, reaching out for Christ and and uh, uniting you in love and growth as a congregation. We're very thankful to God. Now, in these studies in Mark, of which this is the second, Dave Rickards has already reminded you last week that uh, the first point that Mark makes about the uh, gospel is the arrival of John the Baptist, uh, who's calling for people to make their lives ready for the arrival of God. The way he puts it is raise up the lower bits of the road and knock down the upper bits of the road. So there's a level pathway for Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, into your life. And the way that we do that, I'm sure David explained to you and, and challenged you about, is called repent for the forgiveness of sins. That is, has have the kind of change of heart that leaves behind all known wrong, that confesses uh, God is right to say that we do wrong, to say that we're sinners, and to ask him to forgive us. Repent for the forgiveness of your sins, and let the sign of that be that you submit yourself to being washed. So that was John the Baptist's ministry. And now in Mark chapter 1 and verses 9 to 20, we see Jesus himself coming into the public stage of his life's work. And four events are recorded in these verses 9 to 20, uh, which are uh, that Jesus surprisingly submits to baptism, even though he has nothing to repent of personally. Secondly, he is sent by the Holy Spirit, driven out. Um, the word is actually thrown out, driven out into the desert um, by the Holy Spirit so that Satan, Satan can offer him alternatives to his saving work. It, it was a kind of test. Was he really prepared to go through all the would need to be involved in order to be our successful saviour. So he goes out to be tested. He's baptised, he's tested. Thirdly, Mark summarises in brief form his public preaching. He came with uh, very good news, namely that God's kingship is available to anybody who would like. And he said, yes, the way for that to become reality in your life is this repentance, this change of heart when you surrender to his reign and believe this good news. God is willing to um, master your life, um, make it more significant than it ever could have been in other ways. Let him be king and bring you to all that you're capable of becoming hand in hand with Jesus Christ. Fourthly, after the baptism, the temptation and that summary of gospel preaching, Mark records that Jesus, while walking beside Lake Galilee, right on its shores there, called four people, Simon and Andrew first, and then James and John to be his followers. And at once, not waiting to sort out their business debts and anything else, at once, they just left that work uh, with this authoritative call of Jesus and became his followers the baptism, the temptation, the preaching, and the calling by Jesus Christ. Four events, it's quite a packed passage, lots to say, and each of those four events has good news for us. First of all, this baptism, do you notice there in verses 9 and 10, what happens is that as he submits to being washed by John the Baptist there in the Jordan River, the two other persons of the Godhead 
make themselves shown, the Holy Spirit coming upon his life to anoint him, uh, empower him for his life's work, accompany him in it, guide him during it. And then the Father himself speaks audibly to Jesus and he says, you are my beloved son. I'm so pleased with your willingness to go and do everything that needs to be done if people are going to be saved and get to heaven and be your bride and my dear children for time and eternity. So we see that all the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are united and committed to being our King and Saviour, right that is stated at the very start of his ministry. It's not just, however, that he is confirming, I want to do this. Why is he submitting to this judgment of God that humankind are sinners? The answer is he's identifying with us in our guilt and need, even though he has no sin and guilt of his own. He's, as it were, coming and being part of us so as to shoulder all that is involved in becoming our Redeemer, redeeming us from this sin and the power of guilt. There was a very moving incident during the Second World War in a prisoner of war camp that kind of illustrates this uh, identification with others in order to take the rap for them so that they would go free. It was in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, as it happens. Soldiers had taken a work party out to work on a road. At the end of the day, as always happened, they gathered in the tools, checked them, counted them, and lo and behold, the way they counted, there was a spade missing. And they were a severe bunch of army at that point, and the... Uh, commander of the Japanese troops said, um, if that spade isn't found, uh, then the person, whoever did it, has to be executed. Uh, now, who has hidden that spade? And there was a great pause, and he started to give the command for the soldiers to shoot dead every single one of that work party. Just then, one of the work party stepped forward, uh, said it was he, he who had um, stolen the spade. He was shot, and as he was taken away to be buried, they found they'd made a mistake. The spade hasn't been stolen at all. It had been simply overlooked in the count. What he did there was to take the punishment which had been the impending experience of the whole group, and he had taken upon himself vicariously, as they say, that is, uh, representing the whole group and doing it in place instead of them. He died, they went free. And what Jesus, by his submitting to baptism, is saying is this, I will be the vicar, the one standing in vicariously to represent all of you in order to take the punishment from God eventually on the cross so that you might be spared it. He's identifying with humankind so as to be our representative and our substitute before the judgment bar of God. He's submitting to a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in our place. I want to apply that for a minute because while some people find that an easy thing to accept, others need to be reminded of it frequently. And therefore, let me just press home and explore that point with you for a second. If you feel it difficult to believe that your guilt has really been taken away and that for Jesus' sake 
you are accepted by the Father and innocent in his sight, part of his family, accepted as righteous simply for Jesus' sake, then please would you let me just say to you, fly to Jesus, ask him, please, Jesus, I want to thank you in my head, but please will you by the Holy Spirit somehow reach my heart and soul and conscience and enable me to believe that this is really true. You were baptised, as it were, as fellow sinner in my place so that I could walk with a clear conscience. Now, in a sense, that's every day's work. Jesus, here I come to you as a sinner and I bless you for taking that burden off my shoulders and accepting them on your own. You will, many of you know the vision which John Bunyan records in his book, The Pilgrim's Progress. There is the pilgrim, he's called Christian, obviously, and as he is invited by an evangelist to find in Jesus a saviour, he starts to go through life and he comes up a bit of a hill to a place where there's a cross and below it a tomb, or as um, John Bunyan calls it a sepulchre. And as he gazes at the cross and gives it thought and consideration, the burden that was on his back, the burden of being a sinner, of being guilty before God, as he stares at the cross, that burden falls off his back, rolls down into the tomb, is seen no more, and as he gazes at that disappearing of his guilt and shame before God, Bunyan says, the springs in his cheeks start to overflow. He starts to cry, I am a forgiven man. Turn to Jesus if you find it difficult to believe that you're really justified before God in the right in his sight and say to him, Oh, Jesus, grant me your Holy Spirit, for I believe this in my head. I want to be able to feel it. Please enable it to be true, even about that particular sin and that memory that brings me shame. Wipe it all away and let that burden fall into the tomb of Jesus forever so that I walk, as Christian did in Pilgrim's Progress, walk light-hearted and free and glad. So that is the significance of baptism. The whole Godhead is committed, three in one, united and unanimous, to save us and rescue us and welcome us. And as the first step in his public ministry to that effect, our Lord Jesus is baptised representing us and in order to stand in for us before the judgment of bar of God and take our shame of guilt and punishment upon himself. So much for the baptism. What then of the temptation? The Holy Spirit drives him into the wilderness. Why? It's essential, since so much is at stake, that he chooses God's way of becoming our saviour and not some alternate way. Now you will know that the other two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, they say more about the temptations of Jesus. Mark, do you notice, just puts it to be tempted by Satan. He goes there in order for that resolve, namely to save us, be put to the test and he goes to meet the enemy of our souls and to conquer him at that place. It is this victory over Satan on almost day one of his public life's work. It is this victory over Satan which brings the virtue that enables us to say, to quote one of the New Testament epistles, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There is in the saviourhood of Jesus Christ a power to refuse to do wrong and to resist the devil and uh, 
in the victory of Jesus to send him packing. We, of course, have to take that step when temptation comes, instant resistance, constant rejection. But the power for it flows from the victory that Jesus won there in the temptations and flows into our lives as we do what Jesus did, refuse the devil and discover that he flees. His baptism, he's identifying with us. His temptation, he's bringing us the power of victory over life's mixed temptations. Thirdly is preaching. Our Lord Jesus came with such very good news. God's reign is right beside us for the taking. Now, beloved in the Lord, it is a truth from God that I know you will echo in your own experience that we are inadequate for the demands of being God's constant and faithful servants in the way that we run our lives. We are inadequate to do that unless King Jesus takes over and enables our self-mastery and he acts as king and guide in all that we do. And this is the good news that is the very core, says Mark, of what he's preaching. I bring you good news. He says it in both verses, do you notice? Uh, the good news of the kingship of God, the reign of God, the kingdom of God, right beside you, therefore choosing to make your own. Jesus, be king in my life. It reflects the reality that you cannot live the Christian life in your own strength. And the gospel says this from Jesus Christ, let hand in hand with me, let me give you that power and that guidance and that supply of love for the demands which life lays upon you in your calling as a Christian believer. Isn't it great to belong to somebody greater than yourself and be living for the very cause which is why this world exists, namely the kingship of God, the honour and glory that God deserves as King and Redeemer, and God to be giving a people to Jesus as his bride and companion for time and eternity. That kingdom of God is what is available to us in surrendering to King Jesus in our lives. It's why the world exists. At the beginning of time, God had just two people, Adam and Eve, to be his companions and to be his friends. At the end of time, says the book of Re Revelation, there will be a vast number from every tribe and ethnic and language group all over the globe, every nation. There will be an enormous number. And history in between is his story, the account of his calling people to himself. All that the world calls history, the uh, battles and the kingdoms and the social conditions varying through the years, all of that is just a scaffolding to the real reason why there's a heaven and earth at all, namely that God should make a people of his own to be Christ's bride and companion in the new age, in the new heaven and earth that he is going to form after the day of judgment when he winds up history. And so he comes with this good news. God's kingship is right beside you, ready for taking. Again, I say to you, whether you're uh, thinking about the Christian faith, this is what to do. Ask God, surrender to him and say, please, Father God, this is my life. I surrender it to you. I'm so glad you can use me. I'm so glad to have the chance of belonging to you, to have Jesus taking care of me and uh, involving me in his cause. So that's the possibility 
which Jesus says, and it's so simple. He says, there are two steps. Repent and believe this good news. Have this change of heart that says, I'm not going to run my own life anymore. I'm not going to live independent. I'm joining you and your cause and your family, Lord Jesus. I believe that you're willing to accept me, include me, involve me, commission me into your service, whatever is my particular calling in this life, road sweeper or surgeon, teacher or engineer, doesn't matter what. Whatever it is that you're called to do in this life, you can be a significant part of the kingdom of God, the kingship of Jesus Christ, his friend in his service, inviting others, witnessing that it's great to belong to wonderful Jesus. The first step then is that change of heart. And the second step is believe that good news. Faith is to know that invitation, to believe it, and then to commit yourself to it. This I choose, this King Jesus as my King, this Saviour as my Saviour. Three events so far then in these verses 9 to 20. Our Lord's baptism, standing there to be our vicar, the one in our place. His temptation, he commits himself to the saving work and not some lesser calling. The preaching, he makes known to us the good news of God's reign right beside us for choosing and submitting to. And fourthly and finally, this lovely account, he just happens to be walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees two fishermen at work, Simon and Andrew, and he says, can you believe it? Come, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, fishers of other people. And you see what it says there? At once, just like that, Jesus has the right and the authority, the ability to call people, to make something of them in his service. Up immediately they respond and come. And a little bit further on, a rather larger fishing business, it would seem, because there was the father, Zebedee, there were other hired people, there were two brothers, James and John, and under the discerning of the Holy Spirit, Jesus calls the brothers, James and John, and says, you two, leave your nets, come follow me, and they up and follow him. Jesus has all authority, and therefore, as you choose the kingship of Jesus and to be his faithful soldier and servant and witness in this life, you need never be embarrassed about which is the right religion. We see here that the Son of God has all authority to call people to himself to belong to him. And you need never be embarrassed to speak up for Jesus, for God the Father and God the Spirit, by their coming to him during the baptism, confirm that he is the one to follow if you would be in line with the reason this world exists and the safety that Judgment Day offers. Here then, is the core message. Jesus Christ is calling people to live for him. And if you already are, then this morning, say to him all over again, I'm choosing you. Please reign. Rule my life in everything. My choice of time, my choice of service, my choice of friendships, my refusing to do any wrong at all. Jesus King, be my King. Jesus Saviour, be my Saviour. That is the essence of this passage. He has all authority to make you his own, to keep you till the day when he welcomes you after the day of judgment into his kingdom. 
there to be more fulfilled and happy than we've ever been able to be in this life. The kingship of Jesus, yours for the taking, mine for the taking. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for submitting to baptism and the judgment of God on our behalf. Thank you for refusing Satan's temptation to take some lesser course. Thank you for making known the good news that the Father's reign is a kingship that we may have as our own. This morning we choose it afresh. Jesus Christ, be King and Saviour in my life now. And thank you for showing by that sovereign calling of Simon and Andrew, James and John. Thank you for showing us you have the ability to enable our response, to take us into your service, to make us more fulfilled than we could ever be in any other way. Here we give you ourselves and offer you our love and our lives for the sake of your reputation. Amen.